Um, Blame the Space Race is the topic. Uh, here's the official uh, title, Blame the Space Race, Trumpism, School Shootings, Enron, Global Warming, the War on Terror, and Systemic Racism. Um, this is a really nice, uplifting uh, presentation. Uh, for 20 years to Cold War adversary, I'm going to read you the entire description, and then I'm going to couch it in some of what the slides actually end up being. But this is what I submitted. And I usually like to present on close to what I submitted. I strayed a bit. Uh, for 20 years, two Cold War adversaries fought to have space superiority. In July of 1969, it ended when Apollo 11 delivered Neil and Buzz to the moon and successfully back to Earth. Humankind is no better. No, oh, humankind is no better. Yeah, that's a great spoken typo. Uh, humankind is no doubt better as a result. Uh, and this talk will attempt to blame all the current bad shit my kids are around on one nation's attempt to no fair do over their way into space dominance. Um, I can't adequately cover this in the time provided, and I actually am going to uh, skip some parts of the subtitle anyway. Um, but I am going to speak, tease out some of the really bad parts, and uh, I'm also going to leave other bits for you to sort out on your own. Um, and I'm also going to say it's not as bad as it seems. Um, so we know uh, that the space race uh, was uh, the U.S. versus the Soviet Union trying to achieve uh, superiority in space flight. Um, I'm going to walk through a lot of dates in that process. Uh, and where possible, I'm going to note the delta between the dates because I think that's important. So the first thing we're going to do is um, how it ended. Um, I just want to confirm everybody is seeing Neil Arms or no, Buzz Aldrin stepping onto the surface of the moon. Yes. I mean, we can't tell it's Buzz. We just have to trust it is. Yeah, we're good. I, I am not so much of a space nerd that I can identify Buzz Aldrin by his rear end. Um, so I will just trust this is the correct image. Uh, it ran from August of 1955 until July of 1975. Pictured here, though, is the end of the space race in 1969, which is six years before history says it actually ended. But this is when it ended. Um, and we just like believe these, this, this fact. Uh, and so this is Buzz uh, setting foot on the moon as taken by Neil. Um, I, I wrote a space joke in here, and I'm not sure why, but I'm going to do it anyway. So how does Buzz introduce himself at a party? I'm Buzz Aldrin. Second man on the moon, Neil before me. Um, the, uh, the important part of um, the space race is that even though it's noted as August of 55 to July of 75, it actually happened between 57 and 69. So it's a bit smaller of a window. Uh, and so here's where it started. Um, we had the Sputnik crisis. In October of 1957, um, uh, Russia launched uh, Sputnik. And it became um, a thing that really drove uh, the U.S. Um, to um, write a very flexible rule book. Um, it, and so part of the Sputnik crisis, um, JFK campaigned on closing this missile gap with Russia. Russia was clearly uh, superior in missile technology. Um, in 1958, so just a year after Sputnik, um, Eisenhower uh, basically created DARPA, which is a fantastic uh, investment of our money, I guess, Velcro or whatever. Um, and then studies from 55 to 61 um, showed like the Soviet Union was way ahead in uh, scientists. And we have this phrase, this like, concept of STEM now that like sort of started back then. Um, I'm gonna go through three quotes really quickly. I'm going to read them to you. I hate when people do that on slides, but you're a captive audience, so whatever. Um, Eisenhower, uh, the, the, the three tenets or the three uh, stark facts is the phrase that he used is the Soviets to past America and the rest of the free world in scientific and technological advancements in outer space. Uh, if the Soviets maintain that superiority, they might use it as a means to undermine America's prestige and leadership. And if the Soviets became the first to achieve significant superior military capability in outer space and create an imbalance of power, they could pose a direct military threat to the US. Now, here's the thing I wanna hang on to is that last part, direct military threat to the US. This is going to be important as we go forward because we're gonna talk about some stuff that's not military related and then we're gonna get back to military related and then it, that's when the depressing stuff comes. Um, here's the scoreboard so far. So uh, it's one nothing. Um, that's it, I don't have notes on this slide. Uh, this is Laika. Laika was the, uh, she was a street dog in Moscow um, and she was trained uh, there's a ter there's terrible information online about Laika's training, but but part of it was uh, they put her in smaller and smaller cages, and she had the right disposition in these smaller cages. And they said, "Well, we can launch this thing." Um, they uh, she lived for four orbits. Um, they couldn't create a temperature control quickly enough between um, Sputnik, right, uh, October fifty seven, and November fifty seven. I mean, they knew they needed it. It was they weren't like just surprised in those thirty days or whatever. But I mean, just a month after Sputnik, they launched a dog into orbit. Um, so after four orbits in, um, it got too warm and she overheated and died, uh, is the nice way to say that story. Uh, five months later, Sputnik 2 naturally decayed in orbit, um, and 
like a disintegrated on reentry along with the their stuff. Uh, so the US at this point um, reached orbit with a satellite in January of 58. So about two months after Leica, we got, uh, we got a satellite in orbit. Um, December of 58, on a different satellite, uh, the US broadcast a recorded message um, from Eisenhower from space, which I guess is kind of cool. Um, no points awarded for that though. Uh, January of 1959 um, was when the first human made object uh, left the orbit of earth and it was Luna. Uh, and it wasn't on purpose. They just missed the moon and now it's orbiting the sun because that's just how gravity works. Um, space is hard. Uh, August of 59, uh, the US launched a weather satellite and uh, took some of the first photos of space. Um, and then September of 59, uh, the first human-made object to reach the moon uh, was Luna. I actually didn't know. Yeah, it's Luna 2. Um, and it crashed. Uh, but it, it reached the moon. Uh, and that was a Soviet uh, spacecraft. And then October of 59, Luna 3 orbited and took a photo uh, for the first time of the backside of the moon. Um, I didn't actually research like how we got that photo back or anything like that. Or maybe the photo was taken and stored on the satellite. Never returned. I don't know. I need to research that. I don't know what happened to Luna 3. I feel like that's a deficit in preparation here. Sorry, y'all. Uh, so we're going to give a half a point for the, um, I guess, like the first photo from space, whatever, the U.S. broadcast of Eisenhower talking. Uh, the Luna program really, though, gave Soviet Center a point. And the half point is being generous because I, 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 needed, I need a half a point later on, and I'll show you why. Um, this is cool. This is Belka and Strelka. Uh, and now we're, we're, we're 57, right? Sputnik. Now we're in August of 1960. Oh, you'd like to join me? My cat is interested in this as well. Um, yeah, the first animals. So Belkin Stroko, along with a gray rabbit, 42 mice, two rats, um, several plants and uh, fungi spent a day orbiting earth. They were the first higher living organisms to survive in outer space uh, and return to earth. So everything on that mission went up and came back. Uh, I guess alive. I, I don't know if they documented all the mice, but um, there's a lot going on. Uh, so that was August of 60. We're, we're moving quicker or we're, we're having a larger break between the things now. So January 61, US sends up a chimpanzee and brings it back. Um, so launching returning living things, give the uh, Soviets another point. I really thought I would get to this section quicker. Um, we know that the space race uh, was the US versus the Soviets trying to achieve superiority in space flight. And that was uh, right built on getting humans into space. Sure. Um, this is Yuri Gagarin. Uh, one orbit around the earth, one hour, 48 minutes, uh, April of 61. I, just, I love this picture. Um, I might print this one or order it online, have it framed and hang it on a wall. Um, I, I don't know what, what else to say other than like, you know, obviously there was like, the Soviet program is very different than the US program, but uh, I mean, to be the first human flight is, is significant. Um, this guy's Alan Shepard. Uh, he was, um, let's go back real quick. April 12th, 61, May 5th. Um, it feels a little rushed, right? Like, oh, Gagarin orbited the earth. And so Alan Shepard uh, was launched 116 miles, did not orbit, uh, 15 minutes in flight. Um, due to long delays, um, he expected about two hours from when he was loaded in to launch and landing. Uh, after three hours longer of delays, so like five hours on launch pad, he had to pee. And they said, well, you can't do that because um, the electrodes connected to you will short circuit. And that could be a problem. Uh, he said, well, turn him off. So I turned him off and he peed uh, in the capsule. And then they turned it back on after the oxygen flowing down his suit dried the, the puddle enough for it to be safe to turn him back on. And then launched him 160 miles. Um, this was technically the first um, piloted flight by a human. Um, long story to get into that. Um, the, the thing is that this, uh, this Mercury capsule, some foreshadowing was on top of a, uh, redstone rocket. Um, and also, uh, some of the Mercury program was on top of Atlas rockets, uh, which are, uh, Atlas, uh, is probably still familiar as, uh, current ICBM. ULA, uh, is a current launch provider in the world and they still use the, uh, Atlas five, uh, at least till 2025. Uh, so, Humans in space, we're gonna throw some more points up there. Uh, Soviet Union, five to a half point. Um, right, so uh, some more humans. Um, and we're going quicker now. So now we're up to 63 and 65. So in June of 63, Valentina Tereshkovna, um, 
was the uh, both the first civilian um, and the first woman. Three days in, in space, 43 orbits. Uh, then we had Alexei Leonov. Uh, you can see him in the upper right hand corner there outside of the thing, uh, the capsule. Um, the cool thing on uh, Leonov was uh, he was in this uh, craft called the Vakshad 2. Um, and because the two cosmonauts weren't able to get the uh, center of gravity correct on re-entry, they ended up uh, landing about 47 miles from where they expected uh, in a forest um, during a bear and wolf mating season. Um, this was not unexpected. They knew that this margin of error could take place. So they had a pistol and ammunition. Um, and uh, because of where they landed, a crew couldn't get to them before nightfall. So they flew overhead with a helicopter and dropped supplies to keep themselves warm um, because the electric system suffered some damage in the landing and it was below freezing. And so they could run a fan, but not heat. And so they had to survive cold Russian night uh, with mating bears and wolves. God, space flight's awesome. Uh, so civilian woman spacewalk, we're now eight to um, a half a point. I don't even make light of this. Um, and I realized that this font and this picture seems to make light of it. Um, these are the first human deaths that were like on the big stage in, um, in space flight. Apollo 1, uh, now we're all the way up to 1967, January of 67. Uh, and so keep in mind, remember, July of 69 is when this whole thing ends. And we're already into January of 67. Apollo 1, um, in an effort to catch up, uh, the U.S. just threw gobs of money at the Apollo program. I mean, just ridiculous. And um, uh, political pressure and unsafe ideas and whatnot and all the documentaries you see, you're really kind of tiptoe around that. At the end of the day, what we learned from Apollo 1, along with the Challenger disaster, um, are really great examples on engineering ethics. Um, and that's, that's the good news to get out of them. I said I wasn't making light of it, but I needed that half point to deduct a point because here we are. Um, so now, December of 1968, which means we're like eight months away from this thing being over, uh, Apollo 8. Uh, this is a famous picture called Earthrise. This is what I do have printed and uh, framed uh, and hung on a wall. Um, I, I just can't imagine like what this uh, must have looked like. I have spent uh, countless nights laying in bed thinking about what it must must be like to see the earth rise over the moon and what that must feel like. Um, that's not in my notes. I just got distracted. Um, apropos to nothing, December 24th, um, which is uh, in, in the Christian organized religion, uh, is Christmas Eve. Um, the crew was broadcasting from space. Somewhere in there, I guess we could throw in a point or whatever because of uh, like live broadcast from space. The U.S. figured that out. And they read from the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. Um, and so this launched a lawsuit from the founder of the American Atheists, um, and it was dismissed uh, by some, and I put in uh, parentheses with a question mark, probably white cowardly dudes, um, judges on technicalities. Uh, so it, it was never actually, the case was never actually heard, um, but I found that fascinating. Uh, so it's, uh, it's the first full point, I think we could say. And, um, and of course, we're back to this picture of Buzz Aldrin's butt. Um, and the Soviet Union after this, like moon landing, humans on the moon, um, Soviets launched a space station in 1972. Hostile relations sort of ended in May of 72, but this is it, uh, 1969, July 20th, 1969. So I guess that's worth like eight points maybe. I don't know. It's just, it's how the space race was won was that moment. All right, so going back now, um, there's this dude, uh, Werner von Braun, uh, who was a Nazi. And he developed the A9 slash 10 ICBM uh, for the Germans during World War II. So we're, we're back pre-space race talking World War II. Uh, and it was intended to bomb New York uh, and other American cities, uh, US cities. Um, it was initially intended to be guided by radio. And that was super duper challenging, it turned out. Like this was the system that, that needed to happen. So it was changed to be a piloted craft um, that they intended to launch. Um, somewhere along the, along the way, like, uh, you know, World War II ended. We'll get into that because gross. Um, but but Werner, uh, Werner von Braun then became uh, instrumental in the um, development of rocket rocketry in the U.S. because ICBMs are useful for launching uh, satellites and humans and are much less distasteful than launching bombs. So a great platform for research and uh, drumming up uh, national pride. Um, so I don't I don't want to like spoil anything here, um, but this is this that's probably not a surprise to you. Um, the, the thing with the first um, nuclear weapons uh, is that um, there were no, IC, no ICBMs at this point. And so the problem was you had to have uh, bombers fly over to drop them. So on August 6th, uh, uh, 45, uh, Hiroshima was bombed. 
And it took, uh, because of communication at the time, it took 16 hours for Tokyo to understand and confirm what had happened. Uh, and the confirmation came when President Truman um, announced to the world, like, yeah, yeah, of course, we, we killed humans. Um, and then the second bomb was August 9th. I can't imagine what that week must have felt like. Uh, hellacious. Um, so about 40% of residents in Hiroshima and a bit over 30% 30 of Nagasaki uh, died as a result of those two bombs. All right, let's uh, time travel again. Um, this is today. Uh, and this is, this is like after some crazy 80s math, uh, which is how Enron gets swooped into this talk. Um, but the rest of the world outside of these two nations and uh, you know whatever's left hanging out there, the rest of the world has about 1,300 uh, nuclear warheads. Um, so there were two nations really at play here. Um, for what it's worth, uh, we don't know this because we haven't proven it, but, but scientists believe it would take about 100 bombs uh, make it impossible for life to continue on with 100 nuclear bombs. Um, so when you look at these numbers and you realize they're staggering, like they're, they're, they're phenomenally staggering. Uh, so there was this posturing thing that happened during uh, the eighties. And this is during the height of the cold war. Um, the idea was this mutually assured destruction, meaning like we know when you launch your nukes, we can launch ours before yours land, meaning that uh, we're all going to be destroyed. But the reality is if a hundred landed, who cares? Okay, I took a long sidebar and I apologize um, because I just couldn't help myself on space stuff. And also I didn't really expect all the nuclear research to take me where it took me. Um, so let's talk about Trumpism. Um, I noted some key features of Trumpism. Um, I mean, like we're probably still too close to say, is this uh, sufficient? And maybe I'm wrong on some of this, um, but I wanted to call it a couple of things. So the first NASA astronauts, right? Uh, or test pilots. Um, they were the image of masculinity, all men, all white, obviously, right? Uh, and this is what it meant to be an American astronaut and represent, represent the U.S. in this fight against um, the socialism of the United States, or, oh, God, of the Soviet Union. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was, like, the, this idea of, like, false statements, uh, and, and, you know, we had to win the space race, so we just kept rewriting the rules until we did. Um, so I want to um, leave that where it is and just sit. Let that simmer. Um, I want to just jump through some stats here that um, are only related because of, um, I have to move this uh, Zoom window tab thing. There it is. Um, only related just because of that slide back on the uh, nuclear bombs on the US being the only uh, nation uh, in the history of the world to use nuclear weaponry on humans. Um, about 300 nations, uh, US is 4% of the world's population. Uh, we're about 31% of the global weapons market. We supply um, ab about half of the other nations in the world weaponry. Um, defense spending is, uh, believe it or not, surprisingly to me, is pretty consistent um, if you uh, look at inflation year over year um, and uh, consistent in the sense that we spend about as much as the next 10 nations combined. Um, give or take, when you look at it, uh, it's, it's always a majority of those nations are allies. Um, so it's baffling. There's 31 aircraft carriers in the world. Uh, 19 of them are owned by the U.S. There are um, somewhere in the range of 700 to 800 military bases in the world. Um, eight are Russian, seven are uh, Great Britain, five are French, and the rest are U.S. military bases. Um, the Pentagon spends more than all 50 states combined um, on health, education, welfare, and safety. Um, I have like so many stats here, I'm skipping some. Um, 40 to 50% of all privately owned weapons in the world are owned by the US. Um, the I guess the fourth line down is the one that I think is, is just like, uh, it breaks my heart a little bit. 90 to 112 guns owned per 100 people. Um, we, we are well ahead of the rest of the world on averages there. Um, the, the, there's probably almost no category you can look at where uh, related to firearms where the US isn't just like bafflingly uh, ahead in numbers. Um, and this is one of those slides where lower is better. Um, so let's talk about how this relates to Enron, right? Um, on May of 61, uh, JFK had his big announcement where he said, we choose to go to the moon, blah, 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 before this decade is out. You've heard the thing. Um, probably on like an old CompuServe uh, CD, right? This is where you had like a copy of the video clip. Um, so 
you know, at that point, like Sputnik had happened, like it had happened, uh, the Luna program had happened, Belka and Strelka, um, Yuri Gagarin was not far off. Um, so this is like the no fair do over portion of space. Like this is, this is where we were. Um, and, and it was, it was just this crazy posturing and controlling the message that, that led to in July of 69, winning the space race with, um, being the first to, uh, one key moment along the track. Um, I called it global warming in my slides instead of climate change. I don't know. I was thinking there, I, I mean, God, what is there to say? Like, there's just an absolute attack on science now because uh, science became boring along with space as the space shuttle did, like, you know, crystal analysis stuff and uh, super important scientifically, but also, whew, could have used some marketing. Um, I don't know. I skipped this slide. Um, I, here's, some other, here's some other data. Um, you can read yourself. Uh, it's depressing. I wanted to talk about one guy though. Um, his name was Ed Dwight. Uh, in 1961, um, Kennedy said that he needed a colored astronaut. Uh, so minorities could relate to the astronaut program. So Ed Dwight, uh, who uh, graduated cum laude with a BS in aeronautical engineering, uh, earned the rank of captain in the Air Force, um, uh, was shoveled into the astronaut training program. By 1966, he resigned citing racial politics had forced him out of NASA and into the regular officer corps. Um, so I, I want to circle back around to this, like what could have been um, and what is trumpeted is as a, uh, a world changing event um, is, uh, is built on lying, uh, changing the rules mid game, um, defining an enemy um, and, and backing all of this um, military research that took place with this idea of noble goals. Um, I, I think that uh, some of the some of the hero worship that comes along with it um, uh, is problematic. Continues to be problematic, and uh, uh, and the patterns repeat themselves. So as we look at the space race and are excited about what's happened and the space race that's currently going on, uh, the private space race, um, I think it's fair to ask some of the same questions. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Gary. That that was a meandering uh, trip. Uh, almost its own fool's journey uh, to the extent that I don't have any questions. <laughs> I have um, a document of so many notes that I, I wanted to get to. And I just, this is, it's painful research. So Chris, uplift us. <laughs>